All right, let's open our Bibles to 1 Thessalonians. And we're in uh, chapter 4, and we're going to start in verse 9. And I uh, didn't notice last week, so we're, we're going to be looking at verses 9 through 12, only because I didn't cover these last Sunday night. I thought I did. And I even told the Sunday night group when we were done that uh, we were going to have the rapture today, because that starts in verse 13, but I lied, <laughs> straight up, right in front of everybody, just flat out lied. Uh, I didn't know I was lying, but I, apparently I was, because I thought I only needed to get through verse 8, but I really needed to go through verse 12. But what that means is, on accident, uh, we're in this passage this morning. So um, if this applies to your life, it's totally not my fault. I tried to cover this last week. Uh, if you get convicted at all during the Bible study, it's not my fault. Uh, I just, I happen to not do this. If, if your life totally changes because we're in this passage and your marriage gets better, then it's my fault. Um, <laughs> I meant to do that. Uh, this passage we're in is so significant, and I, I just thought it was very interesting. Once I was looking this week, I thought, oh, what did I do? Um, because last week we focused on um, the end of chapter 3 where he talks about our love abounding more and more. So the focus was love. And then look at these verses. We'll start in verse 9 of chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians. Concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. And indeed you do so toward all the brethren who are in Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, that you would increase more and more and that you aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, to work with your own hands as we commanded you, that you may walk properly toward those who are outside, and that you may lack nothing. So again, another passage encouraging them as they had been loving, but to have their love increase. He had prayed at the end of chapter 3 that their love would abound, and now he encourages them that their love would abound. So we're going to get uh, another dose of that, apparently. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the timing uh, as we have made this commitment to study uh, through your word from Genesis all the way through to the last book, Revelation, and just take it each chapter and each verse and just go right in order, right through the word. And so, Lord, you somehow organize these things so that we hear what we need to hear and we're in the right place at the right time. And, and again, once again, you've done that and you uh, have, have uh, given the opportunity for us to spend another Sunday together talking about uh, obeying the great commandment, and the, the new commandment that you've given us, Lord, um, to love one another the way you loved us, Jesus. So pour out your spirit on us. We, we want your love to fill us. And this great statement that Paul makes that we're taught by God to love one another, may that dynamic just grip our lives so that with him we could also say the love of Christ constrains us. From the inside out, Lord, from within, Lord, taught by God, by the Holy Spirit, and that love of God shed abroad in our hearts. So do a work in us, Lord, that would change our lives in every relationship we have and, and even to the ends of the earth, Lord, that we would be filled with love. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the things that I think is so striking about what Paul says here is in verse 9. And it is based on, I think, one of the central concepts of the new covenant the relationship that we have with God now through his son, Jesus Christ. And it's in the phrase uh, at the end of verse 9, he says, you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. He, he says that, he's wanting to say something about love. He wants them to be encouraged at how they were loving, but he wants to see their love just keep growing. But in the middle of it is this great doctrinal reality that they're taught by God. That what he's exhorting them to do is not something that is initiating with him. This is not something that Paul thought, well, you know, this should happen here. This is something that God has said. This is something that is in the identity of God. That's what we looked at last week, that God's basic nature is love, that God is love. As amazing as he is, as uh, he has these attributes that can't be totally fathomed or grasped, his justice, his holiness, his righteousness, his goodness, all the parts of who he is, if you tried to think you understood any one of them, they're infinitely beyond what you could grasp. And yet, at the same time as that is true, you could define God in one word. You can say, God is love. And you'd be exactly right. And that maybe you could say, that's probably 
All you need to know. God is love. That's really, that'll settle it for you. That's who he is. That's what he wants to do in your life. That's what he wants you to receive. That's what he wants to come out of your life. So as amazing as he is, there's also that wonderful reality that it's the love of God that, that, that God is all about. It's his nature. It comes out of him. It's what he's doing. And if we're going to be with him and what he's doing, that's what we're doing. And, and with that simplicity, and so Paul had mentioned that earlier now, he wants to bring it up again, but he doesn't want to do it in a way where they would think that he's correcting them. This is not written to correct them. It's written to encourage them to keep going. You're on the right road, just keep going. You know, if you have been into an area where you've never been before and you're on the road and someone is giving you directions and you, you say, well, you know, you just keep going down that road and then you're going to find the beach. And you go down the road and you go down 15 minutes or 20 minutes and you thought, I thought it was going to be five minutes. And so you see a local, and you pull over, and you say, hey, you know which way? You know, like, did I get the wrong road? I'm just trying to go to the beach. And they go, no, no, just keep going. You're on the right road. Keep going. And that's kind of what Paul's saying. They're on the road. They're, you're on the right road. Just keep going down this road. Don't get off and go on some other road. Don't think that, okay, we did this, and now the status quo is fine. We're not going to really increase this in any way. Well, let's just maintain what we have. Paul doesn't want them to have that attitude with the expressions of love that God would want to have in their lives. He'd want them to have the mindset that if God's done something up to this point, we're rejoicing in that. But what God may do tomorrow, who knows? And what God might want to have accomplished by the next year, who knows? We're we're expecting an increase. We're not going to say, okay, God's done this thing, and now we're going to coast. We pedaled really hard, and we got some momentum, and now we're going to just, you know, tuck and, you know, eliminate the, the drag, and we're just going to you know, try to just coast along. Paul said, no, I want your love to increase. But he's, he's, he's not wanting them to feel like they're corrected. They, they already had a good reputation. He says that in verse 10. Uh, you already do this, he says, towards all the brethren in Macedonia, so not only within their congregation in that city and in the, the way they loved each other, but that love in them prompted them to, to minister to other places. So that any of the believers in Macedonia would say, oh, those Thessalonians, man, those guys are just such a great work of God over there. And they've been over here a few times to help us. And it's just such a cool thing. We had to move from one apartment to the other. And these crazy Thessalonians came. And, and uh, they, I bet they wish they planned their trip on another week. You know, I mean, I mean, it's that kind of a thing. It's just love. It's just, what did you come here for? Well, we came just to love you guys. What, how can we help you? If this is the best way for us to help you today, then that's what we're going to do. So... Their, their reputation had gone through the whole region, so he doesn't want them to feel like you're not doing this, but he wants, he wants it to increase. And as that's his mindset, as he's wanting to get this across, we have that phrase that I pointed out at the end of verse 9, this fundamental reality of, of the new covenant. He says, you're taught by God to love one another. I want you to think about that for a moment. That a person who belongs to Jesus Christ is taught by God. And what that means, the implications of that. In the Old Covenant, the covenant that God made with the nation of Israel, that's in the Bible, it was God's covenant with them. It's a real covenant, it's legitimate. It had a purpose. It wasn't meant to be forever because God said, I'm going to make a new covenant. So when God said he's going to make a new covenant, he just made an old covenant, right? If I'm going to make a new one, the new one's going to supersede the old one, and the old one is obsolete. It wasn't meant to go on forever. There was a time when there wasn't that covenant. God's covenant with Abraham wasn't the same covenant that he made with the whole nation in in Moses. God made a covenant with Noah. It was a different covenant. And so God's free to make whatever agreements he wishes to make. So the old covenant, it was for the nation of Israel, and it was for a season of time, and it was primarily to be a schoolmaster, a, a Uh, a servant that would bring us to Christ. The servant in the house that would take the kids to school. That's the law. It's the servant that's going to bring you to Jesus. How does it do that? Well, the law is filled with 613 commands of Moses. You could summarize those in the Ten Commandments, and uh, those are pretty convicting. You can go through the list of the Ten Commandments, and especially when Jesus adds that God's concerned about the heart, and you realize, I've broken these commandments and, and when you go through the sacrificial system that God's provided for and you realize, how can the blood of a bull or a goat take away the guilt of my sin? It's not compatible. It's not the same. Uh, my blood, my life, who I am, is way different than what an animal is. 
I'm <clears throat> created in the image of God with the capacity to have a relationship with God, and I've sinned against that very nature, so there's no way that a bird or a goat or a sheep or a bull could satisfy the guilt of my sin. And it was all to prepare this concept of there needs to be the death, there needs to be sacrifice, the consequences of sin or death, and that in the right time, in the fullness of time, God would send his son. And now a human being, Jesus Christ, the only begotten son of God, who's God and man, comes and he dies on the cross for my sins. And now there's a sacrifice for sin. The other sacrifices are pointing to this sacrifice, but now Jesus is the sacrifice for sin. And when he died on the cross, the veil of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. And that, that veil signified the separation. The people couldn't enter the temple, only the priests. But the priests couldn't enter the holiest place where the presence of God was. With the Ark of the Covenant, there was this curtain that was there that separated them. And when Jesus died, the Bible says that curtain was torn from the top to the bottom, signifying now access to the very presence of God. Not only for the priests, though. Jesus made himself our great high priest, so we don't have any need for uh, earthly priests because we have access to God. There's one mediator between God and man, the Bible says, and that's the man Christ Jesus. He's the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. So if you want to have a relationship with God, then here's the good news. You can and you say, wait a minute, I've sinned. I've done many sins. I, I'm so guilty. I, I'm ashamed of the way I've lived. I've been so far away from God. Well, Jesus Christ died on the cross so you could have this access to God. He's the one that can bring you to God. He provided the sacrifice. He's now the priest. He's the mediator between God and man because he is God and he is man at the same time, simultaneously, satisfying the wrath of God and the guilt of sin in his own body. And so the Bible talks about this new covenant and with the statements of these new covenant, of this new covenant, uh, are promises about a, a new work of God. In the, in the old covenant, the law and the requirements and you could say the will of God or the plan of God were outside of the people. God wrote on stones with his finger the Ten Commandments, and Moses came down with the Ten Commandments holding them. The people had broken the Ten Commandments already without even knowing that they were there. And, and the, the story of Israel's history is a repeated failure of, of obedience because the command's on the outside and on the inside is the struggle with sin and the failure. And they, the, it's just show me, I, I need someone to save me from this. And, and so here's this statement. If you want to try to find Jeremiah, it's Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah is pretty easy to find in the Old Testament because it's huge. It's 52 chapters and it's kind of almost right in the middle. So if you open to the middle and... Look for Jeremiah, you'll, you'll find it. Chapter 31 is a promise of this new covenant. Chapter 31, verse 31 is where we're looking. God's speaking. God says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And then he's specific. Verse 32, It's not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. Notice this. I will put my law in their minds. I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they will be my people. When God announces this new covenant, he says it will be distinct from the old one. It won't be like the old one. In what, what way, God? In the fact that the, the law was written outside of the person, in the new covenant, I'm going to write my law in their minds. I'm going to put it in their hearts. God's promising this new work that will change the inside of a person. It'll make it so that the desire for the will of God and the knowledge of the will of God will happen internally. It'll happen in your mind. God will actually put it in your mind. God will actually put it in your heart. Very different than the old covenant, and very different than our experience when, with any of the rules that we have to follow. When the rule's on the outside, you might find yourself a rule breaker. I don't know if you're naturally a rule breaker. I personally am. And one of, I think one of the reasons maybe why I became a pastor is because I, I love to disturb teachers while they're teaching. I, I, and I, I've been in different class settings, and I, I just find myself, oh, yeah, I forgot what I was like as a student, you know? It's just my inclination. As soon as someone says, line up like this, I want to go like that. I just don't, I just, like if there's a rule and it's on the outside of me, it's just within inside of me, it's just the, like, let's break it. 
Let's get around it. Let's do something to upset the thing. And so my nature is one way, and I can maybe even look at the rules. I see why these rules are here. They're great rules. I just don't want to follow all of them. I don't like the way you're applying them. I don't want to do them. God's saying, I'm going to do something to you. I'm going to do something inside of you. And I took my finger and I wrote in a stone the law. I'm going to take my finger and I'm going to write in your mind my law. I'm going to change you on the inside. Wow. Now that's something I'm interested in. I've never been able to follow the rules. If there's rules, I'll break them. Rules that I make myself. I don't know if you guys ever have done that, where you like, made a resolution or you said, I'm not ever going to do this, and 10 seconds later, you're already planning how you're going to do it. <laughs> Even the rules that I make, I don't find myself able to follow. But if there's a way that God could overcome me, God could do something inside of me, in my heart and in my mind, but that's what he's promising. And then look at verse 34. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord, and I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. Sin will be put away. It'll, it won't be remembered. So if you're here today and you're feeling guilty and ashamed of your sin, well, I got some good news for you. I know how it can be put away. Through Jesus Christ, it can be not remembered. You might keep remembering it, but you can know that if you've confessed your sin, if you've given your life to Jesus Christ, God doesn't remember it. It's gone. He doesn't, he doesn't hold it against you. Forgiveness of sin, the deliverance from sin, and then this new identity where God's working inside of us, in each of us. And so he said in verse 34, you won't need anyone to teach you. It won't be every man teaching his neighbor, saying, know the Lord, because you'll all know me. There won't be a group of priests or, or an elite group or some special society or some board or group or whatever that says, we're the ones that know, you're the people that don't know, you, if you want to know, we know, you come to us and we'll tell you and then you'll know what you're supposed to do. God says, that won't happen anymore. You don't need any other mediator between God and man. You have Jesus. God's talking about every single individual believer having a relationship with God and the knowledge of God. So it won't, there won't be that uh, need anymore. Uh, a similar statement uh, that, that Jesus actually quotes when he's kind of talking about this th- same thing is in Isaiah 54, 13. You don't need to turn there. We're just going to refer to it. All your children shall be taught by the Lord, and great shall be the peace of your children. What a great promise. All your children will be taught by the Lord. So who's going to teach us in the new covenant? God. He's going to speak to us. He's going to teach us to know him. He's going to call us to himself. He's going to reveal himself. That's, that's a basic promise it's a kind of a it's kind of a this a central truth of what the new covenant is it's a distinctive it's if you want to say if someone says well what's the difference between the new covenant and the old covenant you can explain it you can explain it in the most important way by saying well in the old covenant it was on the outside and in the new covenant it's on the inside in the old covenant it was you trying to obey in the new covenant it's god working in you and doing a thing inside of you and your mind changes your heart changes Amazing. So how does this happen? Well, it all happens by the Spirit. And if Paul says here in our passage, you're all taught by God. You're taught by God to love one another. How does that happen? Turn to Romans chapter 5, verse 5. Romans chapter 5, verse 5. He says, Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. The Holy Spirit who's given to us. So how do you get the Holy Spirit? Well, you can't get the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has to be given to you. You can receive the Holy Spirit. Well, how do you receive the Holy Spirit? You accept Jesus Christ. You receive Christ. Confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you'll be saved. Give your life to Jesus. The Holy Spirit will come and make your heart his home. And when the Holy Spirit comes into you and makes your heart into the home of God, the love of God is now poured out into your heart. It's it's given to you. It comes from outside of you. This is the distinctive of the new covenant. In In the old covenant, it's you should love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you should love your neighbor as yourself, and there's the commandment, and it's written in stone, and you should obey it, and it's the law of Moses, and it's 
the identity of God, the heart of God. This is, you know, Jesus answered the question, what's the great commandment? Love God with all your heart. What's in the second, love your neighbor as yourself. There it is. What's my problem with the commandment? Nothing. I love that commandment. My problem with the commandment is I'm unloving. And I can try to be loving, and I, I'll try, but, but my experience at the end of every day would be just utter failure. I wouldn't be able to do it. But if I, in the new covenant, receive Christ and the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of me, what happens inside of me is love from outside of me is poured into me. And now I have something I never had. I got it. It's real. It came from God. And it changes your life. It's God writing his law in your mind and on your heart. The love of God poured out by the Holy Spirit given to us. And remember that passage about the fruit of the Spirit when Paul talking about the battle between the flesh and the Spirit, our old nature and our new nature. And he says, but the fruit of the Spirit is his love. You want to know if you're filled with the Holy Spirit? Is there love? <laughs> That's the mark. Not knowledge, because Paul said if you had all knowledge so that you knew everything and you knew every mystery and you didn't have love, you're nothing. So knowledge isn't the thing. He said you could have all the gifts. You could speak with the tongues of men and the tongues of angels, but if you don't have love, what did he say? You're just a clanging symbol. You're just a wind-up monkey, just king, 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 you know. <laughs> You're just a noisemaker. You're an irritant. You're not, it's not helpful. Without love, you can have all of those things, and without love, they're nothing. The mark of the Spirit is love, the fruit of the Spirit. The, and fruit is what, such a great analogy. It's not a product. It's, it's the result of life. If you want to know if your trees are doing good, go see if they're bearing fruit. If you go out to your fruit trees and they're not bearing fruit, you wonder about, well, how, what's the condition of this tree? Is it getting the right kind of water? To, probably didn't fertilize it. Maybe it's, something's wrong with the soil. You know, it's not dig, getting its roots in. If you don't see the fruit, what do you, you're not, you, you don't start yelling at the tree, you dumb tree. You know, I paid all this money for you and did all this work. And why don't you just work hard? Come on, tree. You know, you, you see the tree with no fruit and you immediately realize there's a problem with the life. Something's wrong here. Something's wrong with the life in this tree because the natural byproduct of life is fruit. So Jesus said, if you abide in me, you're going to bear fruit. If you stay connected to me, if you, like, a, like a, a branch is abiding in the vine and produces fruit, if you abide in me, you're going to produce fruit. So how do you have this fruit come out of your life? You have to be connected to Jesus. You maintain that vital living connection. The love of God poured into your hearts, connected to Jesus. The life of Jesus is your life. It's coming from Jesus into you, and then it can be in you, and it goes out of you. You have something. Instead of uh, just your own efforts. Paul wrote this about the Spirit. In 1 Corinthians 2.12, he said, we've received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who's from God. And he says this specifically, that we might know the things that are freely given to us by God. That we would know the things that are freely given to us by God. So the Spirit, when he comes to live inside of us, he's wanting to communicate with us all the things that God's given to us. Boldness. So if you're timid, and you're an introvert, and you'd rather just avoid interacting. And, and then the Spirit's inside of you saying, notice that person. No one's talking to him. No one even knows him. And you're thinking, I don't notice people like that. Like, I don't, I'm that person. <laughs> Someone should be noticing me. And then, no, it's inside of you. No, you should go over there. You should go talk to him. I don't go, I don't know. And inside of you, it's like, you know, yes, yes. And now you're in an argument to do the right thing. And you think, what? Where is this happen? Who's I'm possessed. <laughs> yeah, you are. Quite literally. You've received not the spirit of the world, not some demonic spirit, not some other spirit. You've received the spirit from God, and he's inside of you now, and he's teaching you about what God wants to do with your life. He's going to break the mold. He's going to say, yeah, yeah, that's how you used to be, but that's not how you are. That's not the real you. That's the dysfunctional you. That's the one that's marred and scarred and bent out of shape and got melted and then got, <laughs> got hardened in this weird thing. I'm, look, we're getting that. That's gone. We're not doing that anymore. And it's ever increasing and it never stops and your love just keeps abounding. The Spirit of God inside of you keeps just making you different. He wants to do that. It's a basic truth. And then I want you to turn to this verse. 1 John chapter 2. This is one of the great encouraging verses 
I think uh, it's just so fundamental to our understanding of what this new covenant is and what our place in it is and what our, even in some way our relationship with one another Look at 1 John chapter 2, verse 27. He says, oh, let's start in verse 26 because it's, uh, it's a continuing thought. Verse 27 is the key verse, though. In verse 26, these things I've written to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you, but the anointing which you've received from him abides in you. And then notice this thing that he says. You do not need anyone to teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true and is not a lie, and just as it is taught you, you will abide in him. John says, I'm writing these things about people who are trying to deceive you. So he does, he does see himself as a teacher. He's trying to give them an encouragement. He's teaching them. He wrote this letter. He's obviously a teacher. And yet at the same time as he's saying that, Concerning deception coming towards these people, he says, listen, you've received something greater than any teaching I could ever give you. You've got an anointing from the Holy One. What is that anointing of the Holy One? Well, we just have been talking about it. We've not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who's from God. We're born again. We're, we're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's living inside of us. And so you could be a brand new Christian with very little knowledge of the word of God and meet somebody who has a false teaching, and they start talking to you, and they're sharing a bunch of stuff and quoting all these verses of books that you didn't even know were in the Bible. And they're pointing, and they're turning to all these things, and they have all this highlighted, and you got your first verses highlighted. And you don't know anything about the Bible. And they're talking to you, and inside of you, you're just thinking, this is totally wrong. I know what they're saying is not true. And you just know it. How do you do that? Every single one of us who's a Christian has had an experience like this where someone's talking to us and trying to share something. We've all... There's enough weird teaching out there, and someone's, and you're just in your heart, you're thinking, I'm not going to argue with this person, I am not going to say anything, because I don't have any idea what I would say, I just know that this isn't true. You just know it. You know it's not right. Where does that come from? Are we just arrogant? You just walk around thinking you're right about everything? No, because you know you're wrong a lot of times when people are talking to you. They're talking to you, and you're like, oh man, nailed, oh dude, you got me, you're right, oh. Even if you don't tell them, you're like, well, I don't know what you're talking about. You know on the inside, you've been, you've been busted. But what is it happening when there's a doctrine that no one's even taught you yet, and someone's twisted it, and they're bringing you an alternative version of it, and you've never even been taught that yet, and you know that you know, you think, I'm not going down that road with you. I don't, I'm not seeing it. I don't know why. I, don't, I can't tell you what verse, but I just, it's not, that's not true. How does that happen? John says, you've received an anointing from the Holy One. <laughs> you don't need anyone to teach you. This is super encouraging if you're a teacher, by the way. I'm a teacher. I'm teaching right now. And John says, you don't need anyone to teach you, so guess what? You don't need me. Isn't that cool? My goal as a teacher is to help you realize how irrelevant I am. My goal is for you to realize, oh, wait a minute. He's just reading the Bible. He's just letting it mean what it says. There's nothing magical about this. Guess, any donkey could get up there. Balaam's donkey did a great sermon. I mean, anybody could do that. Yeah, yeah, that's it. You got it. You don't need me. Now, it's a blessing to have teaching. The Bible says there are gifts of teaching um, there, you know, there's gifts of prophecy, there's word of knowledge. We can all minister to each other with all of our different gifts. This doesn't take away from ministry to one another or even uh, pastor teachers ministering the word of God. That's not the point John's making, but here's the point he's making. You don't need anyone to teach you. You've, you have God. He's living inside of you. He'll teach you. Now, he's not going to teach you something that goes directly against what the Bible says, okay? So you can't pull that one and say, you know, well, God just taught me how to rob banks, man. You know, I don't, you know, hey, I'm just good at it. I'm just good with the safe. You know, I'm a safe cracker. Uh, no, God didn't teach you that because God said thou shalt not steal. So God's not going to teach you something that's directly opposite of what his word says. So obviously always the word of God is what our standard is, not what you think God is teaching you. We always test what we think God's teaching us with what? With what God's already said. So we can never contradict what God's already said. But how amazing that John says to these people, 
that he's writing to these believers, hey, you guys have received the Spirit of God. You'll know. I'm warning you about these things, I'm, and I'm telling you this doctrine, but I know that when I'm telling you this, you already know this. The Spirit of God inside of you has, has taught you. So let's go back to our passage with this kind of a reality of the new covenant and these, I think, really kind of remarkable statements uh, in the New Testament describing um, this new relationship with God. And consider what Paul then says again in our verses back in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. In verse 9, again, Concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. So what's he talking about? Well, within the context of the Bible, we know exactly what he's talking about. God's made a new covenant when he's writing his law in our minds and putting it in our hearts. The Holy Spirit's been given to us, and the love of God is now shed abroad in our hearts, poured out into us, and now we're filled with the love of God, and we're taught by God about whatever God wants to do in our lives. That's awesome. Now, every single individual believer has got a direct connection to God through Jesus Christ. So if there's an exhortation uh, to love, or there's a teaching on what love looks like, or Jesus has an example of love, and you listen to a teaching on that like we had last week, it can be encouraging, but it's all given within the context of you're taught by God. God has to teach you how to love. Now, if God's trying to teach you how to love, then it's incumbent upon you then to learn how to love, right? Because some, God might be trying to teach someone how to love, and they might not be that interested in learning how to love. They might be justifying themselves and saying, oh, there's no way I'm going to go do that. Not after what this person did. There's no way I'm going to, I'm not going to. And then now God's trying to do something, but in our own stubborn will, in our own heart, we're fighting against the work of God inside of us. So we may not always listen to what God said, but we can be sure that God will teach us. He'll teach us how to love. He'll help us. He'll speak to us. And so they, were, they had this experience. They were loving. Verse 10 had said that they were showing their love even through their whole region, all of Macedonia. But then he adds at the end of verse 10, we urge you, it's an exhortation, we urge you, brethren, that you would increase more and more. So the specific application, God's teaching you to love. So as a husband, you can pray and say, God, teach me how to love my wife. As a wife, you can pray and say, God, teach me how to love my husband. As a child, you can say, God, teach me how to love my parent. As a parent, you can say, God, teach me how to love my kid. As a friend, as an enemy, Lord, teach me how to love my enemy. Teach me how to love my boss. Teach me how to love this person that I'm supposed to, they're supposed to be helping me and they're not helping me at all. Lord, teach me how to love them. And God will teach you. But get ready for it. Because he'll teach you, he'll tell you. He'll, he'll show you what to do. He'll give you direction. And Paul wants them to have that experience, and he wants it to increase. He doesn't want them to be satisfied with what God has already done. He wants, to, he wants them to be pursuing love. He wants them to be expecting greater outpouring of love, greater realization of love, greater expressions of love, so that one of the marks of the church would be an ever-abounding experience of love. If you think of yourself a year ago or five years ago, how loving were you? You think of what you're involved in today and, and who you are today, it should be increasing. You should, you should be in more uh, difficult situations. Because <laughs> remember, love is self-sacrificing. You, be you should be being pulled. You should, you should be feeling that experience of, man, this is, a little bit, this is a little bit more than I could chew. You know, this is a tough one. This situation, man, we're really giving here. Yeah, good, your love's increasing. What's the example of love? There's a picture. Jesus dying on the cross. There's a picture of love. Arms stretched out, nails in his hands and in his feet, had been crowned with a crown of thorns, beaten, hanging from a cross, dying for our sins. Let your love increase and abound more and more. And then it seems like... Uh, he makes an application that wouldn't maybe be the one that we would expect. Having said all of that, provide that basis, Paul makes specific applications starting in verse 11. And he makes three points. In verse 11, his application of your love increasing is these three ways. That you would aspire to lead a quiet life, that you would mind your own business, and that you'd work with your own hands. 
That's loving. <laughs> mind your own business. Is it, you know, you say, have you ever said mind your own business to somebody? Did you say it with like a sneer on your face? I don't know that you can say that nicely. I try to say this. Every time I read it, I go, mind your own business. Like, I can't say it. Can you even say that nicely? Try it today. See if you can say that to someone nicely and see if you don't get a bad reaction. I don't know. Like if, if one of your kids said that to you, there's no way a kid could, there's no tone of voice that would ever make that. Or you say, could you ever say that to your wife? There's, what's the smile on your face? Mind your own business. You can't, you can't say it anyway without it being like. <laughs> I mean, it's just. So here's, here's how Paul specifically applies this. It's not, you think, you know, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of passages about love. John applies it in a certain way. Peter talks about love and applies it in a certain way. Here's Paul with this church. What he, what he, he's, he's aware of their circumstances. He, he understands the culture. He was in their town. He started this church. So he knows the individuals. He knows what their struggles are. He knows what, he knows what the history is with the community, the tremendous persecution that was happening there. And so... Let God's love abound. You're, you're doing this. It's so amazing. It's great. All of Macedonia has been touched by your love. So let your love keep increasing and that you would lead a quiet life and you'd mind your own business and you'd work with your hands. That's, that's how the love of God would be showed. It's not some monumental, don't get on a plane and go to Ukraine. Not, hey, go to Africa, move to Africa and do this or you know, go down here and do this hard thing. It's just, it's the most simple thing. He says, aspire to lead a quiet life. One of my favorite commentaries in my library is a commentary that's written by these uh, scholars in the original language, and uh, they're experts in Greek, and so they go through the, the, the text of the, of the Greek and look at all the grammatical circumstances, you know, how the words are, what they mean, what they mean in their context, how the verb forms are, all this stuff. It's very technical, but the application of it the, the commentary set was written for Bible translators. It's called the United uh, Bible Society's Handbook. But it's this massive set of commentaries, and it's, very t- it's, it's got all this technical Greek information, but all the application is not like to a scholar, but to someone who's living in Papua New Guinea, translating the Bible for the first time, wanting to use the original language and go straight into that language. Not translating from English into that tribal language, but going straight from the original into their language. And so... Because in some of these places there are figures of speech, like mind your own business might be kind of a figure of speech or uh, aspire to lead a quiet life. And so what's fun about this commentary is they'll talk all about this, the tenses of the verb and all this really technical grammar stuff that I kind of skim, you know? I mean, I read it, I pay attention to it, but I'm kind of like, okay, where's the meat, you know? And so I'm reading through and then I'll, but they always make these applications and a lot of times they'll, they'll give examples of, you know, well, in Navajo, this is how they translated it or in this other language... Some languages you're looking for, here's what the text means, and then, and then here's, here's different examples of how they uh, translated it. So this idea of aspiring to lead a quiet life. The point is, is, is um, to have a restful life, to not have a life that's just full of a lot of drama, okay? Just be drama-free might be a way you could translate it. Or it was interesting because one of the languages they were referring to was a language from Africa and so they, they talked about a phrase that I was pretty familiar with from a cultural perspective of all the ministry we've done in Ghana. And I've heard people even say this. And so they, one of these, in one of these languages, they translated the phrase as, don't go around making a lot of noise. Because in, in some of those villages where we've been, like, that's the way you just describe somebody who's a troublemaker. You know, they just go around, and I've heard people say it, like, he just goes around, he just makes a lot of noise. And what do they mean by that? Everywhere the guy goes, there's a problem. He's a, who's a, there, you hear some commotion. Well, he's at the market. You know, some commotion at the river. Well, he's at the river. Or there's some problem over here. He went to visit his uncle. He's visited his uncle. Now there's a shooting. I mean, it's just something. This person's a noisemaker, a troublemaker. The, the concept it can be communicated in every language. Every language has some way to express that person, right? Do you know people like that? Maybe you're one of those people. Maybe this is the part where you're like, oh, okay, I see why you were here on this passage. You're a troublemaker. Don't go around making a lot of noise. Now, they were already being persecuted, so it would be very important for the believers to, to, um, to express their love to people in a way that their culture was not just going to blow up. 
that Paul had been forced out of there after only being in Thessalonica for three Sabbath days. It, it, there was so much drama when the church started. So listen, here's how you show love in your community. You guys don't be troublemakers. You don't go around making a bunch of noise. You, you, you love people. You love people. Don't make a bunch of noise about it. I couldn't help but think about that passage in 1 Corinthians 13 about if you speak with the tongues of men and angels but you don't have love, you're like what? Clanging cymbal, sounding brass, or you might say a noisemaker. That's a troublemaker. Someone who's got great spiritual awareness, great spiritual gifting, but doesn't have any love, what are they? They're not aspiring to lead a quiet life. They're clanging the cymbals. Don't be like that, Paul says. You want to let your love increase? Well, let it increase like this. Be quiet. <laughs> I don't know that I would ever have thought of this on my own if this wasn't the, actually what the passage said. I might think of my own life. This, it applies. Hey, don't create drama. Don't create drama in your family. Don't create drama where you work. Some people just, they thrive on it. They want it, or they clamor for attention. Jesus warned about doing our, 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 our good deeds and our prayer and our fasting to be noticed by men. We just studied this passage on Wednesday night, Matthew chapter 6. He said, you be careful that when you do your good deeds, you don't do it to be noticed by men because when they do a good deed, they blow the trumpet. So here's another application, not leading a quiet life. You could say, well, I'm just doing this thing and, and you know, you're just creating all this self-focused energy. You know, get the attention on me. Don't do that. That's not loving. Paul said, let your love increase. Aspire to lead a quiet life. Don't go around making a lot of noise. And then this, this next phrase, mind your own business. And uh, guess what it means? <laughs> yep, that's what it means. It means do your own thing. Be about your own thing. Now, love means having your eyes off of yourself and on someone else, right? Like love means usually you're carrying someone else's burden, you're helping somebody else. So obviously, love is other-centered. So what does Paul mean when he says, mind your own business? Well, he's talking about being a busybody. The, the, there's, there's some verses in the Bible about being a busybody, right? In the New Testament, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 15, let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or a busybody in other people's matters. So think about Peter. He's thinking of sins. You know, you suffer as a Christian, but don't suffer as a murderer, or what? A thief, or an evildoer, or a busybody. Like, that's kind of elite company. You know, you're in prison, you're on death row. What are you in here for? Murder. What are you, next cell? Evildoer. Next cell, busybody. <laughs> a busybody in other people's matters. We might be just a little too preoccupied with what everybody else is doing. You know, maybe the most loving thing we could do is just say, you know, I don't really know anything about that. I love that person. Don't really have anything. Don't, what do you want to even talk about that? You've got nothing to say about that. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 13. Paul says this. He says, besides this, they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but also gossips and busybodies, saying things which they ought not. He's not talking about people outside the church. He's talking about believers. That their behavior would denigrate to the point where their, their life is to just go around and talk about what other people are doing and meddle in other people's affairs and put their nose in somebody else's business. So this is the application Paul's making. Let, I want your love to increase. So, you know, lead a quiet life. Don't go around making a lot of noise and mind your own business as an example of love. Now, Go back to 1 Thessalonians, and you'll see there's a book right after 1 Thessalonians, and it's called 2 Thessalonians. We don't know which order these are written in. They're not dated. They didn't come with a date. Paul didn't put his name on the upper right corner, you know, put the date. It's assumed that 2 Thessalonians was written second. Um, it could be that they're in this order because it's shorter. Sometimes it seems like the way they organize, put the books in the order is, is the longer one is first. Sometimes they're in a, in, a, in a chronological order. 1 Corinthians is written before 2 Corinthians. So it's up to debate about this. And, uh, but look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Because remember, he just exhorted in 1 Thessalonians what? Let your love keep increasing. Lead a quiet life. 
Don't meddle in other people's affairs. You mind your own business. But then look at, he is very direct in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 11. We hear, he says, we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busybodies. So, apparently, the teaching was necessary. <laughs> so, here's, I want your love to keep increasing. Don't go around making a lot of noise. Don't be a busybody. You know, work with your own hands. Chapter, in second, second Thessalonians written, is like, we're here, some of you guys aren't working, and you're going around being busybodies. So, what does it mean? It means they didn't listen to him. So the correction becomes more specific and more direct. That's one of the reasons I think 2 Thessalonians is written second is because the more general and gentle teaching comes first and the one that's more direct and straightforward is second. It would be as if they got the first letter and said, oh, that's an interesting thought. Now, have you heard about so-and-so? I can't believe they did that. Did you see that guy's face when he was on the metal stand? Oh, my gosh. Oh. He, I don't even think he knew the words of the songs. Can you believe people do that? Oh, my gosh. Can you see my neighbor? Look at my neighbor outside. What's he doing? Oh, my gosh. I was going to invite him to church, but I don't know if I want him there. You know? Like, <laughs> knock it off. Stop. Stop being so preoccupied with what everybody else is doing. When you stand before God at the judgment seat of Jesus Christ and give an account, whose life are you giving an account for? There's only one person you're accounting for. Who is it? And how's that going to go? you got plenty to worry about. Do you want to be preoccupied with what someone's face looks like or what they're doing or not doing? Just look in the mirror. Plenty to deal with. Plenty. I got plenty. I got, I got more problems inside of me. I don't have any... I don't, how can I be worried about this other guy? What he says or doesn't say or does or doesn't... Like, man, I, I'm trying to follow Jesus. So my, I, I'm expressing that love by keeping my focus on the Lord and praying for my friends, not, not being a busybody. And then this last sentence, and I already referred to it because Second Thessalonians, apparently they'd come around to the idea that maybe they shouldn't work. So Paul gives this as an exhortation. The third one is in verse 11, at the end of verse 11, to work with your own hands as we commanded you. So they'd already given them command. Work with your own hands. And there's a result of this one, verse 12, that you may walk properly toward those who are outside and that you would lack nothing. So the result is probably the result of all three. Uh, could be specifically referring to working with your hands, and it applies to that, but it, but it applies to all three. You want to walk properly towards those who are outside, then don't make a big clamor. Don't draw a bunch of attention to yourself. Don't advertise your great. Just be humble. Lead a quiet life. Mind your own business. Be that person that's, that's the stabilizing influence, not the troublemaker, the one that makes all the drama. And then that you may lack nothing. Paul said he wants them to work with their own hands. Manual labor is what is being exhorted here. And there's a cultural reality that uh, there's plenty of writing by the Greeks that manual labor is abhorrent. I mean, manual labor is to be avoided at all costs. And if you're doing manual labor, there's something wrong with you. And there was a very much a, uh, a unskilled labor and the elite class division within society, just in general. And that, that generally is just how human beings segregate. It's, we're better, these people do our work, and we just kind of enjoy it. I mean, there's just that class difference. That's, our countries always, we have, we have a great middle class, but that's always a battle. Like one of the things people talk about is the, the, the growing wealth gap, and people are concerned about that. Why? Well, because human nature is to separate on this, on this very basis. So the, the first century was very divided culturally. And so it would, it would seem that a lot of the folks in the church were in the one group. And so Paul says, listen, don't disdain yourself. Do your work. Work with your hands. Do it. And why? So you're not dependent upon anybody else. Independence. He wants them to work hard so they'd be independent. Now, remember, what, what are we talking about here? You're taught by God how to love. So what are you going to do? You're going to work hard and be independent. Well, that doesn't seem like loving. Can I just give them a card? No, get a job. <laughs> Go do something productive. Who's going to teach you this? You're taught by God. God's going to be working in you, and the love of God poured into your heart is going to make you feel like, I want to do something productive so that I'm self-sufficient, so that 
I can meet my needs, and then I have a surplus, and I can meet other people's needs. To be a producer, produce something, something noble and working with your hands when you make something. You've done it. When it's done, there wasn't anything there before, and you took these materials, and when you were done with it, there it was. It was a finished product, and you made something. That's noble. That's good, and, the, and that's an expression of love. So work hard. Be a producer. I think that one of the things they're struggling with, and by the time we get through 2 Thessalonians, you'll see it, is that there, is, there, was a, there was a struggle that they had with thinking of Christ is coming so soon. I don't really probably need to do that much. Maybe I don't even need to work. And, and maybe there's other people that have stuff. Maybe they'll just take care of me. Right? Can you imagine in a society where people thought like that? This should just be given to me. Listen, God's not teaching you to think like that. That way of thinking is not from God. It's from my flesh. Because, baby, I can think like that. Oh, I'm so good at it. I'm natural. I came out of the womb like thinking, hey, I'm ready, man. Who's going to take care of me? I never stopped thinking like that. That's how I think, but that's my old nature. So what's God doing? What's God teaching me? He's saying, Rich, you're not a taker. You're a producer. The love of God saying, Hey, mind your own business. Don't go around making a lot of noise. Work really hard so that you meet your needs and you're self-sufficient so that you can help other people. Get yourself out of, the, out of the water, onto the shore, so you can throw lines out and get other people out. That's, that's the expression. That's the specific application. Very interesting how he applies it. And so we want to do that. We want to apply it to our lives. And it could be that you're here this morning and... Uh, you haven't given your life to Jesus. What a great Sunday to come and listen to a particular, just you could say almost at random, passage of Scripture. Just here we are, we're going through the Bible. You happen to be here on this day. We're looking at this passage. But think of what you heard this morning if you're here and you don't follow Jesus, you don't know him. What you heard is that God loves you and that even though you're a sinner, he sent his son to die for your sins. He loves you that much. And Jesus did that for you. He died for you and he rose from the dead. And you can have life by believing in Jesus. And you know what else you heard? You heard that God wants to come into your heart and make your heart his home, and he wants to write his law inside of you and on your mind, in your mind and on your heart. He wants to pour his love into you so that all the things that God wants to do, he wants to teach you from the inside, and the Spirit of God working in you will change your life. Now, what's your part? You need to receive Christ. The Bible says as many people as receive Jesus to them God gives the right to become the children of God to those who believe in his name. You need to put your faith in Jesus Christ. You need to say, Jesus, I'm not trusting myself. I'm not trusting my righteousness. I want to trust in you, and I want to trust in your righteousness. And you ask him to forgive you for all your sins. You ask him to come into your heart, and he will. And he'll come, and he'll make your heart his home, and he'll write his law in your mind, and, and you'll experience the love of God inside of you, and then you'll stop going around and making a lot of noise. And then... You'll be a producer instead of a taker. You'll see your life change from the inside. It won't be because someone wrote a bunch of laws and put them on the outside and intimidated you. It'll be because the Spirit of God's inside of you teaching you and speaking to you. So I invite you to respond to the message and give your life to Jesus. Father, we pray for help. Lord, we look at something like this and we're so thankful that Paul prefaced this teaching by saying you're all taught of God to love one another. So teach us, Lord. Teach us the ways where we go around making a lot of noise. Teach us, Lord, the ways where you want us to do something different. Teach us, Lord, the ways where we're not minding our own business. So we would. We wouldn't waste any energy on something as unproductive as that, but we would put our energy into producing. Lord, as Paul said here, work with your own hands that you could have something to, uh, to provide for yourself. So, Lord, help us. Help us, God. Help us in these very simple ways where our lives can change so profoundly. In our marriages, in our homes, Lord, change our lives. Teach us. And then also, Lord, if there's anybody here who's not a believer, we pray that you'd speak to them, they'd open their hearts to you, and they'd receive Christ. If that's you, I want to lead you in a prayer. You can pray this prayer with me, and God will hear it, and he'll answer it. So you can repeat after me. Just say it to God from your heart, and he'll hear it, and he'll, he'll say yes. So say, Jesus, please forgive me for all my sins. And please come into my heart right now. And I surrender my life to you. 
Be my Lord and Savior. And fill me with your spirit and with your love. And help me to live for you. Give me the hope of heaven and make me a brand new person as I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Father, we thank you that it's that simple to just pray and ask and that you hear those prayers and you answer them. And so we pray that on the basis of faith, the work of of Jesus on the cross, that you would forgive and cleanse and transform those who might have opened their heart to you. We pray that you'd speak in a mighty way to all of us, Lord. We'd We want our love to increase more and more. So help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.